For Krama Media in Johannesburg, I'm Sane Lamini. Janine Lazarus is in conversation with Polity about her true crime memoir titled Bait to Catch a Killer. So Janine, this book is about the serial rapist who was on the loose in your neighborhood in Norwood when you were a crime reporter for the Sunday Star. Can you give us some background into this case for those who are not familiar with it? I was living in Norwood in uh, the late 80s, early 90s. In fact, I lived in Norwood for many, many years. And there was uh, two women were raped within a two and a half kilometer radius of my block of flats. And as chief crime reporter, I missed the rapes and uh, my editor would have nothing of it. You must understand that in the early 1990s, South Africa was going through a huge transition. The townships were on fire. There was a township war. Um, Politics was certainly the narrative of the day. So as much as I tried to protest that the rapes were tucked inside a daily newspaper and that the political narrative was leading the news of the day, The editor would have nothing of it. So he dispatched me with my tail in between my legs to go and piece together the story. And that's precisely what I did. I went through the general police line of communications. I then followed up with the notorious detectives from Brixton Murder and Robbery Squad. The rapist, as happens with a lot of people who are psychopaths, his rapes morphed into murder. So what he would do initially is he would climb up the first floor drain pipes of blocks of flats. He would enter through the open bedroom windows. Back in the day, there were no burglar bars. He would pistol whip his victims who were sleeping, then rape them, then tuck them in bed, wish them a good night's sleep. And then he would go into their fridges and he would bite into chunks of bologna or cheese, gulp down milk or orange juice from a carton. And then he'd slip out the way he came in. His rapes morphed into murder when he turned on the lights or his victims turned on the lights. If they saw his face, he determined they needed to die. Because I was living in the epicenter of his crimes, the woman who died, interestingly enough, the two, he killed five women. Two of the women, he killed Julia Hitchie and Jenny Matfield, I share the same physical profile. Dark girls, I had long dark hair. Same build, same height, and also interesting, same uh, J starting with their names, Janine, Julia, Jenny. When I later asked him if he was looking for a particular profile, he said no, it was a crime of opportunity. But these girls all lived right around my my flat. Jenny Matfield was raped in Eliana Court, which is a building, or was a building directly behind my block flats. Uh, Julia Hitchie was raped in a commune less than a kilometer of my block of flats. And the two rapes that happened before the murders happened next door and also behind my block of flats. I was then asked by the police if they could use my flat as a surveillance point because they told me off the record three weeks into the Nord Killers attacks that they assumed he was a policeman. And the reason they assumed he's a policeman was because police issue cartridges were found at the crime scene, fired from a police pistol. The police stayed in my flat. Um, It was a horrible time because they had their own key to my apartment. Their radios were chattering through all hours of the night. They were loud, they kept their own time. I had two cats who hid under the bed for the duration of their stay. And one dark night, they asked me to walk down Iris Road. Now, I used to teach step classes at what was known as the Sharper Image. So I walked down Iris Road. It was probably midnight. I knew that there were police with sharpshooters on my roof. Um, And I walked past the Sharper Image gym on my left, the Nord Police Station, and the Nord Police Barracks on my right. And the police assumed that he was living in the single barracks. Well, he didn't come out to get me because here I am talking to you today, Sonny. So what I did is I crossed the line because I've been a journalist for 37 years and it has been beaten into my brain by every editor I've worked with that you don't get involved in the story. But I did. I got involved because he was raping and killing within my neighbourhood because the police asked to use my flat as a surveillance point and then they also asked to use me as a decoy to lure him in. So that just broke about every single rule in the journalism guide. It doesn't just throw my ethics into question. It throws the ethics of my much-adored editor, Dave Hazelhurst, Hazy, 
how he put a report in the line of fire. And it also throws the ethics into question of the police. How did the police use a reporter to lure a serial killer? This also happened when the country was in transition politically. Yes. Can you tell us yes. a bit about that? Absolutely. It was 1992. Nelson Mandela and F.W. de Klerk had just been awarded the Nobel Peace Prize at UNESCO headquarters in Paris. The Boy Patong massacre was one of the bloodiest massacres the country's ever seen. Nelson Mandela and Winnie Madikizela Mandela got divorced and it was front page news and there was a whole lot of invasion of privacy. People voted, most same people voted yes in the referendum. So this was a pivotal time in South African in, in South African history. And to beat the political reporters with a crime story week after week after week was something of a feat because a changing country, a country that was being rebirthed into a democracy was the story of the day. And uh, the serial rapist, as we've just shared, he was a policeman indeed. And you got an exclusive interview with him shortly after his sentencing. Yeah, without giving much away, uh, were you at least able to uncover, Janine, why Gobas uh, did what he did? Well, you know, I failed three times around. So the first time I, 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 the editor came down on my head like a ton of bricks when I missed the two rapes happening within my suburb. I failed as a police bait. I walked down those, that dark street of Iris Road. I never lured the killer. And the third time, the killer left Norwood because police were fingerprinting single white police officers and they knew that two applied for a transfer. Mm -hmm. He moved in with his parents in the East Rand. And what he did was that he jumped over a wall and he raped a 16-year-old and a young girl living with her single mother and then he shot her in the head. Now, it wasn't Bricks and Murder and Robbery Squad who eventually got him. It was the boys from the East Rand, East Rand detectives. And I missed on his arrest. And my editor was furious, Asani. This is the third failure. So he packed me off to court. And I sat behind the killer in the Rand Supreme Court. I smelt his sweat. I watched his bowed back. I watched him looking at the court through hooded eyes, saying that he had given his life to the Lord and he asked for forgiveness. And I watched him being manacled and taken downstairs to the holding cells. And I don't remember crying, but I obviously was. I know that the court emptied. And I know that I sat there watching motes of dust dancing in the sun's rays. And I know that my back was aching because the court benches are very, very uncomfortable. I remember a plainclothes man, a blonde man coming up to me. I didn't know he was a cop. And he said to me, in Afrikaans, are you English speaking? And I said, yes, I am. And he said, why are you crying? And I said, well, I'm the journalist, Janine Lazarus. And he guffawed out loud and he said, you're the girl reporter. He said, do you want an interview with him? And of course, I thought that it would be like Clarice Starling uh, facing Hannibal Lecter in Silence of the Lambs. And of course, the story was everything to me. So he smuggled me downstairs to the holding cells. This had never happened before. And Kubis Haldanais was housed in a cell at the far end of the corridor. And he came forward to the bars of the cell and he looked at me and he greeted me by name. He said, hello, Janine. And of course, I burst into fits of tears and he took a piece of, I don't know if it was tissue paper or toilet paper inside his cell and he stuck his hands through the bars of the cell and he wiped my eyes. And he said that he, he, he looked so forlorn, he looked so pathetic, he looked so remorseful. And I mean, I should have known better. This man destroyed families, he destroyed women's lives, but he just... He complained how his parents were holidaying in Cape Town and nobody had been to see him. And he said he couldn't stop himself. He said it was this thing, this urge. And he said he left clues all over his murder scenes. He left his DNA, his semen, his saliva. When he raided fridges, he, he would leave his DNA there. He left his grandfather's gold citizen watch at one of the crime scenes. And he said that if he got out again, he would likely do it again. He said he could not stop himself. They arrested him and he, he shrugged his shoulders and he said he's tired. He said he'd had enough, he wanted to be caught. How would you then now, uh, Janine, compare the police strategies that were used then uh, to how they operate now when it comes to dealing with such crimes? 
Okay, well, in, in 1992, the term serial killer only just came into being. The word killer was on the cusp of the serial killer phenomenon in South Africa. Remember that why the killer evaded the police was he shared a weird physical anomaly with a man known as the Butcher of Rostov, a man called Andrei Chikatilo, the, the, the Soviet cannibal. Both Quibus Haldanes and Andrei Chikatilo have two different blood types. So the blood type that they secrete at a crime scene, their semen, their saliva, their sweat, is completely different from the blood type that they are. So the police are looking, for example, for a blood type O, because that is the blood type at the crime scene. But these are men that carry two different blood types. So back in the day, in 1992, DNA was not what it is now. So this was the proverbial needle in a haystack and why the Nord killer evaded the police for so long, because they were looking for a particular blood type, but he had two different blood types exactly the same as the Russian serial killer. The Russian serial killer killed 85 people. He was found guilty on 58 murders. He would grab his victims in the south of Russia at the railway station, pull them into the Russian forests in Rostov-on-Don. He would cut their tongues out to stop them from screaming. And he was a cannibal killer. He would eat pieces of their body while he killed them. And again, he killed over a 20-year time spree, and Russian police couldn't track him down because of that physical anomaly. So today, we have DNA. And I mean, and, and we, we understand DNA now. So, you know, perhaps he wouldn't have evaded the police capture for as long as he did. Janine, I thought posing uh, as a decoy to trap him was scary. How was the experience for you? It was scary. And, you know, Sane, at no point, I mean, the police told me that he was a, that he was a cop. At no point did I even give it some thought that maybe the police who were looking after me in my flat could have been one of him. It could have been him. I had no thought. I mean, I knew he was a cop, but I... So now I've always been driven by my career and I was driven by the story and I wanted a piece of it and I wasn't going to let it go. I knew that I was sitting on the biggest scoop as a crime reporter in my life. So was I fearful? To a point. I mean, I, I slept with a baseball bat next to my bed. I don't know if I thought if he climbed in the window, I would play baseball with him. But I, I, I lived in fear. I would take different circuitous routes home. I wouldn't pop over the road to the supermarket. I wouldn't walk down the street and go and have a glass of wine at one of the trendy coffee shops or meet a date over dinner. Yeah. But when the police asked me to go down that street, all I knew was that I was on the biggest story of my life. And I might have felt some trepidation, but I knew that this was my story and I needed to own it. You must also have met some of the victims while you were working on the story. Can you tell us about it? I, as I said, I used to teach at the Sharper MA gym, which now no longer exists. His victims yeah. were in my class. You know, I knew them. I knew them in passing. They spoke to me. We weren't friends, but they were of a similar age, you know. Mm -hmm. So a woman in their late 20s, early 30s, I knew them. You know, Norwood in those days wasn't what it is now. Urban decay has, has crept into Norwood, and it's, it's not what it was. It was a very hip and happening place. You know, young women like me lived on our own. It's where I loved. It's where I, where I fell out of love. It's where I... I used to walk up and down Grand Avenue all the time. So when the killer, during the killer's terrible reign of terror, if you take a drive down Grand Avenue and Iris Road, you will see burglar bars that never existed before. Nord became a ghost town. Women moved in with their families, with their boyfriends. You'd see seven women, you know, packed into one car, driving around at three o'clock in the morning, just going round and around the sub suburbs because they were too scared to go home. And a woman who came into Norwood would come in the morning to feed their cats, water the plants and leave again. It really was like a ghost town. Would you briefly share with our viewers uh, another developing news uh, based on this book? There's two bits of developing news. One is that Jacaranda FM, I was blessed to have a podcast. They were extensions of, of my book, and that's had phenomenal listenership. It's really been excellent. But what's really exciting is that a television series, a, a cliffhanger six-part television series, is currently in pre-production and development. I'm working with Clive Morris Productions. Um, there's been a lot of interest uh, by, by various networks, and it's going to be a story of my life and uh, centered around the threat of the Nord serial killer. I understand that you visited uh, Corvus in prison uh, in 2020. 
Can you tell us yes. why why were you visiting him? And he said that he was if he was not caught then, he would still be doing what he did before. How did that make you feel? I visited him again in 2020 because he had he's just applied for his fourth parole. And Cloud Morris Productions said, how about going to see him? This man has haunted me for so many years. I mean, you know, the first time was when I met him. The second time was 12 years after I left newspapers. He applied for his first parole. Uh, the late Dave, Dave Hazelhurst, my former editor, asked me to write a story on him. And the headline was, God help us if he gets parole. Some years later, in 1997, the same Cloud Morris Productions did a 13-part uh, series called Criminal Minds anchored by the great voice Malcolm Gooding, where we focused on 13 of South Africa's most famous crimes. One of them was the Norwood serial killer, and Sané, the actors staged a rape scene in my bedroom and a murder scene in my bathroom. So that was the, my third connection with a killer. And now that the killer applied for his fourth parole, I decided to go and visit him. And I was the first group of visitors after stage five lockdown. The killer had been starved of any visitors. His mother, his fiance was also an ex-felon. And he saw me. I think he was so hungry and so keen to be, you know, to see somebody that he just started to talk. And he knew exactly who I was. When I said to him, I'm Janine, he said, from where? I said, Nord, and he looked at me and I said, do you remember we shared a sandwich? Because a warden made him a sandwich while I was interviewing him and he nodded his head. There was former journalist Janine Lazarus in conversation with Polity about her true crime memoir titled Bait to Catch a Killer.